so for today's lesson, you have a note sheet titled prokaryotes. We're going to talk about prokaryotes still in biology. You're going to fill out some information on your note sheet, and then, of course, any additional information um, that you feel is necessary or need to know, whether it be from what you see on the lesson or for what you hear me say. Some of the information that's within the notes that you're going to watch here on the screen um, will not require you to fill out anything on your paper, but for the most part, um, it will. All right. Who can remember when we talked in the very beginning of biology what prokaryotes were? Singular cell organisms. So, unicellular, they're unicellular organisms. What's unicellular? You don't need to wait for me to write. If you know what it is, write it down. What is it? Uni is one cellular, one cell. The most important thing to remember also is they do not have a nucleus. No nucleus. Why is that important to know? Okay, that's where the DNA is, is, is located for what type of cell? Eukaryotic cell. We know that the nucleus is what? Why is the nucleus important for a cell? It can tell the directions for what the cell to do. So eukaryotes are more sophisticated. What does that mean? Self-efficient, yeah, they're more efficient than unicellular organisms. And the main reason is because eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, unicellular cells do not, but they still survive. And we're going to go through all of the things about a prokaryotic cell or unicellular um, cell. There are two groups. One is eubacteria and the other is archaebacteria. And there's some very important characteristics that you must know about prokaryotic cells. They're not as complex as eukaryotic cells, so it's not a lot of information that you, must, that you need to know, but you will be, have to be able to compare and contrast the differences and the similarities between the two types of cells, being prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells. So, some very important information about a prokaryotic cell. It does have DNA. The DNA for a prokaryotic cell is long and circular, kind of looks like a rubber band all scrunched up. Or a bunch of rubber bands all scrunched up. So although it does not have a nucleus, it does have DNA. So no nucleus. It does not have any membrane-covered organelles. What do I mean when I say that? Doesn't have what? What are they? What are some? Mitochondria? Nope, not there. Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is the liquid. That's not an organelle. Doesn't have a Golgi body. Doesn't have lysosomes doesn't have an ER. It does have a cell wall, like a eukaryotic cell. In a plant cell, the cell wall helps retain its shape, and it's like a protector for it. Not all archaebacteria have a cell wall, however, but for the most part, all prokaryotic cells do have a cell wall. It does have a cell membrane as well, and that's the gatekeeper, just like in a eukaryotic cell. It's going to control what comes in and out of the cell. It has cytoplasm, which is the fluid and liquid inside. And it has ribosomes. For this, the ribosomes are made of protein and other materials. Okay. 
see how simple a prokaryotic cell is? Not all the organelles that you have to know and what the organelles do. It doesn't have that. It's very simple. No complexity to it. But although it's very simple, there's some major things that we need to know about prokaryotic cells. Can I move from here? We're going to break down the two types of prokaryotic cells. What were the two types that we just learned? Eubacteria and archaebacteria. The last thing here, flagellum. Most of them have a flagellum, not all of them. But the flagellum, flagellum, flage la la la. flagellum facilitates movement. So it's kind of like a tail. Okay. <laughs> so it kind of looks like a tail, and it's for helping bacteria to get around. Some have more than one flagella. All right, let's take a look and see what Timmy Moby has to tell us about bacteria. Huh, that's odd. Oh, me. Did you clone a microscopic version of yourself? Why do I not believe you? Dear Tim and Moby, what are bacteria? From Sarah. Bacteria are single-celled microscopic organisms, and they make up one of the six kingdoms of life on Earth. They're also the most abundant form of life on Earth. There's something like five nonillion of them right now. Five nonillion? That's a five, followed by 30 zeros. Even though they're too small to see with the naked eye, bacteria are all around us. They live in our food, our water, our air, and even inside our bodies. In fact, there are more bacteria inside your digestive tract than there are human beings who have ever lived. <coughs> well, I guess there aren't any in your digestive tract, but the ones in my digestive tract are pretty important. They break down molecules that my body can't digest by itself. And without bacteria, cows wouldn't be able to eat grass. Plants need bacteria, too. They convert nitrogen in the soil into simpler structures that plants can absorb more easily. Of course, not all bacteria are our friends. Some of them can be pretty nasty, actually. Bacteria are responsible for strep throat, food poisoning, tuberculosis, and a whole bunch of other diseases. Don't worry, most of these infections can be treated by drugs called antibiotics, which kill the offending bacteria. Oh no, bacteria actually come in lots of different shapes and sizes. But the most common forms are rods, spheres, and spirals. Some can't move, but others move using tiny hairs called cilia, or whip-like strands called flagella. But whatever they look like, bacteria are prokaryotic cells, meaning that their nuclear material is not surrounded by a membrane. Right, unlike animal and plant cells, most bacterial cells don't contain many complex organelles. Inside their cell walls, they're pretty simple. There's a nucleus-like structure called the nucleoid, which contains genetic material, and also some ribosomes, which make proteins. But that's pretty much it. Some bacteria are able to generate their own energy through photosynthesis, and some survive by digesting chemicals in their environments. Most bacteria reproduce asexually in a process called fission, Fission produces two cells with the same genetic material as the parent cell. Some bacteria, though, exchange genetic material in a process that's closer to sexual reproduction. Well, two bacteria can exchange genetic material through a thin tube. Bacteria can reproduce very quickly, sometimes as fast as once every 20 minutes. Because because their stru structure is so simple, bacteria can mutate really quickly too, which means they can evolve pretty, pretty fast. One thing's for certain, though. Life as we know it wouldn't exist without bacteria. Yep, bacteria are among the oldest forms of life on the planet. No one really knows the exact order of events, but it's thought 
that early bacteria evolved around 3.5 billion years ago, roughly at the same time as other prokaryotes called archaebacteria or archaea. And for several billion years, these guys were the only forms of life on Earth. Oh, pretty. Back then, there was very little oxygen in the atmosphere, but bacteria changed all that. Through photosynthesis, they slowly filled the atmosphere with the oxygen we complex organisms now breathe. After all these years, bacteria and their archaea relatives are still around. You already know where bacteria live. You can find archaea in some of the most extreme places on the planet, like hot springs, salt lakes, and deep ocean vents with no, no sunlight. <laughs> Gnarly, man. Seeing how these guys survive in such inhospitable environments gives scientists a peek at what life was like billions of years ago. I hope it wasn't like that. Alright guys, I'm sorry for the choppiness of the video, but you get the gist about bacteria. So let's go through our notes here. We're going to talk about eubacteria first. <clears throat> eubacteria is also known as bacteria. So when you talk about bacteria, you're talking about eubacteria. The thing that you want to um, also put on the paper is it's everywhere. Next to aka bacteria, it's everywhere. And this is the most common um, form of bacteria. Like I said, if this is a bacteria, whenever you say, you know, that has bacteria on it, it's germs, often you're talking about this type of bacteria because this is the most common. Um, just want to throw something out there. If you notice, your notes are set up like a study guide. When you're studying, you need to get a blank copy and study your notes like that to see if you can fill in blanks on there. For the eubacteria, they're most common prokaryote and live amongst everywhere almost everywhere. I had you write it twice because I want you to really drill that into your head that this bacteria is everywhere. On your hands, on your skin, on the table, on the floor, in the air, it's everywhere. In your body, and there's several different types. There's more types of bacteria on earth than all living things. So bacteria outnumbers us. Most of the bacteria are too small to be seen without a microscope. They're like invisible invaders. In you bacteria or bacteria, it is an organism, so it is alive. And it functions independently, meaning it doesn't need anything to be alive. It's not like a parasite, it doesn't have to live off of anything. It has DNA, so it is a bit more complex. And most bacteria live in warm places. So places like where? When I say places, I mean like your everyday life. Inside of you, you're warm. Where else? Bathroom. Yeah. Where? Telephones, your hands, your underarm pit. <laughs> Your shoes, your feet. Why is it important to keep your keep good hygiene? Because bacteria loves the warm places. Your bathroom is important to clean because the bathrooms are normally warm. And it loves that area. Under your bed, in your closet, in your dirty clothes hamper. You bacteria are classified by the way that they feed, meaning the way that it eats. One way, as producers. What's a producer? It makes it makes stuff. So, what would a producer bacteria be considered to do? What? Making its own food. How do you think it makes its own food? Photosynthesis, which uses the the sun. So, you bacteria that are producers, it's often green, and they use uh, the sun to make their own food.
You sure can. You can put whatever extra stuff you need to put on your notes. Nothing prohibiting you. You bacteria can also be classified as consumers. What's a consumer? Taking in. Taking in. You're a consumer. You, you buy stuff, you take stuff in. So consumer bacteria would be one that does what? Eats other things. So, so far the producer makes its own food. The consumer eats other things, organisms, other matter. And then you have a decomposer. Breaks things down. So it feeds on dead organisms, breaks those things down. And the reason why we say it's a decomposer is because the things, like if animals are dead out in nature or plants are dead out in nature um, or fruit or vegetables, this bacteria is growing on there. How many of you have ever uh, looked under your bed or in your refrigerator, something that you left in there for a while, or in your book bag or your locker, and you notice a piece of fruit or some type of food, bread, or something's there. And what normally does it have on it? It has mold or and bacteria is all over it. And what it's doing, it's growing bacteria, or the bacteria has now invaded it because it's everywhere. The bacteria that's all around is now breaking that down. It's feeding on it and eating on it, and that's why you see it. Uh, bacteria is like everywhere. Whenever they steal something, air ties of bacteria still be It still has bacteria there. But it's still the type of outside bacteria will not um, create a chemical reaction and feed on it and break it down. Yes? Mold, not bacteria. No. We're going to be talking about that later. Mold will grow as well, but mold, not bacteria. Uh, we'll talk about that a little later. You could get sick, but for the most part, uh, most of the time, it depends on the type of mold. Some medicines are made from mold, but you don't want to eat mold because it could be very toxic. Mm -hmm. if, like, have they ever been able to see it like with a high powered microscope or something? You can. Remember it said that most you have to see with the microscope, some bacteria you don't. Fungi is not, fungi is a decomposer, some of them, but that's not bacteria either. And we're going to be talking about fungi later and mold later. It's not as complex as eukaryotic. When I say it's not that complex, I mean as us, as our cells. But it still has some complexity to it because it still has DNA, and it's an organism that has to survive. All right, good question. Not only can bacteria be classified by the way that it feeds, it's also classified in three shapes. And on your notes, you have one area that you're going to label, and you have two other areas that you're going to draw. Bacilli is the typical bacteria, and it's rod-shaped. Bacilli is the one that contains the functions that we are the um, parts that we broke down in the beginning of the notes. So it has that DNA that's coiled up like a rubber band. What do you think this dark gray outside area with these spikes are? That would be the cell wall. What about the inner white part? Cell membrane. Label it if you know. What about this yellow stuff on the inside? Cytoplasm. These little red dots. Ribosome. What about this long whip-like tail? Read your notes. Flagellum. There you have your cell wall. Cell membrane. That yellow stuff on the inside again is cytoplasm. Little red dots are your ribosomes, and that tail is the flagella. <coughs> Doesn't have a whole lot to it, but it still is enough <coughs> for it to survive and be so many of them. And the reason that uh, they survive so well and the sophistication of it is when we go through the cell cycle, our cell cycle has to create our nucleus as well as creating all of those other organelles to be identical. When this reproduces itself, what happens? 
that's all it needs to do. It just doesn't have much. So that's why it's so sophisticated because it can be so many of them. And having many of them means that there's many organisms. Having many of our cells means one organism is just bigger. Those are um, low cilia, and they're not with every cell. That's why we didn't label it. We'll talk about it later. It's a pear-like structure. Is it on like a certain type of raw They're on most, but they're not on every bacteria. If you want to label them cilia, you can. That's C-I-L-L-I-A, cilia. And that will help you for future notes because we'll be talking about cilia later, so label it. Question that. All right. The next shape we're going to be talking about on your notes, but let's take a look at some live bacilli. going to show us the inside. I think in the video one does a uh, stereo introducing itself. There's another one reproducing itself us an example of what bacilli look like. There's a lot of them. The next shape is uh, cocci. And you should be drawing these uh, spherical shapes. Just those circles, that's what it looks like. Very simple. And while you're drawing, I'll play a little short video so you can see that. Cocci. You don't have to, they're just circles. We don't need the sound. We, we, don't, we just don't need the sound. It's just, just background sound noise so that you all can hear me if I need to say something. But they are spherical, and there's a bunch of them. And they group together. And then, the, then it just goes through the rod-shaped one that we just looked at before. Um, and then we'll be talking about the spiral one in a moment. But if you saw in the beginning of that video, those were the cocci one. Again, they do live on their own. This type of bacteria is the type of bacteria that would cause strep throat, the streptococci. And that what strep, that's what strep throat is, staph infections and gonorrhea. This is the bacteria that would cause that or be present. Uh, staph infection is a staph bacteria. It's like a, a rash uh, on the skin, eats away at the skin. All right, so now you have that one. The second type is uh, uh, spirilla. Can we draw it like the one that was in that video just now on this? You can. It's like drawing the spiral. They look like little spaghetti um, uh, or... What are those noodles called? Goulash noodles? What are those? Rotini, yeah. The long spiral shape. They do have a flagella on both ends. While you're drawing, here's a little short video for you to see 
Is I'm in action. This is under a high-powered microscope. There's no sound with this one. If we're looking under a microscope, that's what it will look like. I'm just all over the place. Makes my skin crawl every time I see it. All right. So you have the three shapes. Again, remember that you bacteria is classified by how they eat and their shapes. The next type of uh, prokaryote is the archaebacteria. Archaebacteria is also known as archae. So you'll hear bacteria for you bacteria and just archae for archaebacteria. They're very different than you bacteria because they're a much smaller group. <clears throat> they're extremophilate. Now that's incorporating our Latin or yeah, our Latin words together. What does that mean? This is Greek. What do you think that means? <coughs> Philae doesn't mean many. Philae comes from philos, means love. So what do you think this means? Extreme they're extreme lovers. So they love extremely. They're ex so you want to write that down for the definition. They're extreme lovers. Meaning they're going to live in extreme areas. They're living in conditions where no other organism can survive. Archaebacteria is going to be classified by where they live. There are three main types of archaebacteria. One is thermophilae. What does that mean? They're heat lovers. So where are they going to live? Just hot? Like just um, if I turn this heat temperature up in here? Extreme hot location. They're halophilae. Halo means salt. So what does this mean? Salt loving. They're living in areas that's very, very salty. Like ocean. Salt lake. Methanogens. What word do you hear there? Methane. So they're methane makers. They're found in swamps. Methane is found in swamps. Now, if methane's in swamps, what else do you think's in swamps? This bacteria because it's making the methane. So one second. So that is both of our bacteria is classified, and we're just going to go in and see what does that mean for you. Which one is the most common to come across? You bacteria. Well, I know that, but like out of these, like the three, the heat loving, salt loving, and methane, would it be salt loving? Because like there's multiple. Mm, not necessarily, because you could have salt loving and heat loving in the same area. Because in California, it's extremely hot there, okay. um, at certain times of the year, and then they have salt water. So, but you're gonna have you bacteria. So there, it's every bacteria is everywhere. Okay. All right. So now let's see why is this important to you. Bacteria's role in your world. Some are harmful, but some are helpful. So just because it's bacteria doesn't mean that it's bad. It could be good. Can bacteria adapt to different places? Mm-hmm. Because remember, it feeds on things. It can make its own food, like in the sun. So let's take a look what she has to say about bacteria in our world. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's down. Yeah, it's down here. Of course, you have to see what you have to say. Hi, my name is Mary Papenra, and I'm an adjunct professor of biology. I'm going to talk about good bacteria versus bad bacteria. Aren't all bacteria bad? 
Isn't that why we have our instant hand sanitizer always at the ready to kill that 99.9% .9 of germs? Absolutely not. In fact, if all the bacteria on the planet were to disappear today, all of the other organisms, the plants, the animals, the fungi, including us, would cease to exist. We need bacteria. For humans, bacteria help to aid in digestion, to produce vitamins, as well as to keep us healthy. And for the ecosystem, bacteria help to recycle nutrients and are an essential part of every healthy ecosystem. So what is a bacteria? Well, a bacteria is a prokaryotic organism, which means that this single-celled prokaryotic organism does not have their DNA located in an organelle, like a nucleus. But even though the majority of bacteria are completely harmless to humans, there are some of those critters that are harmful, and we call them pathogens. Pathogenic bacteria make humans sick by excreting a toxin. Either it's an exotoxin or an endotoxin. Exotoxin is a toxin excreted outside of the cell. An endotoxin is going to be a protein toxin that's found on the outside of the membrane of the cell. Now, our best defense against pathogenic bacteria are antibiotics. However, our overuse and inappropriate use of antibiotics and antimicrobials is causing some bacteria to become resistant. So next time you reach for that instant hand sanitizer, think about the impact that your choices have on the health of your environment as well as yourself. Thanks for watching, and if you want to learn more about this subject, click on the link below. Or if you want to learn more biology, feel free to click on any of the links around me. And please, rate, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Or maybe, if you have ideas for more videos, send us an email at requests at mahalo.com. So, she basically was telling us about the benefits and the harmfulness of bacteria, as well as the harmfulness that you may do to yourself by trying to kill all of the bacteria. Because when you try to kill all of the bacteria, you're killing the good and the yeah. and the bad. So when you kill the good, that op opens it up for the yeah. the bad. So you kind of have to have a balance and overuse of anything, whether it be antibiotics or um, uh, hand sanitizer, anything that's used to kill bacteria would could possibly be bad as well. All right, so let's take a look again and see how it's helpful for the environment. Recycling. It doesn't matter. Um, on your notes, you're not writing all of the information about recycling. You're just writing recycling. But the um, helpfulness of bacteria in the environment is it helps us to recycle. It will decompose, meaning it will break down bacteria, dead organisms. Um, I'm sorry, not bacteria, dead organisms, eliminating dead material. So if we have like a dead animal or something out or dead plant, bacteria is going to come in and eat and feed on that to help recycle that, get rid of it. It also makes other nutrients for us, so it'll break it down, put it into our soil, and then that soil um, will come up in the air, through the water cycle, we'll be talking about later, and those things are good for us. In the environment, bacteria is good for bioremediation. What is that? That's also the breaking down and changing of harmful and hazardous chemicals. If a hazardous chemical spills or something happens, Bacteria will come in and break that down, removing it, removing those pollutants from our world. Nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is very important for our environment as well as our animals and our plants. Bacteria is responsible for changing the nitrogen that's in our air to something that our plants need to grow. So again, you should have written down three helpful uses for the environment. Recycling, bioremediation, Nitrogen fixation. Good? Yes? Say the word again. Bio. It's bio. That's life. It's remediating life. <laughs> Got it? Okay. Why is it helpful for humans? Let's take a look at a little short video. And while we're waiting for that video to load, if it will load, 
Um, it's helpful for humans in our food to help uh, with digestion. So it's in our food, it's in the food that we eat to help us with digestion. All of you have eaten yogurt before, right? Have you seen that um, one with, uh, what's her name? Um, Jamie Lee Curtis? Yeah, and she, what is that one? My activity, uh, yeah. And she says it's good for your digestion, not because it's going to go down and smoothly pull everything out. It adds the good bacteria back into your body that our body needs. We already have bacilli in our body, and that bacilli is responsible for breaking down the stuff that we put into our body to help us digest it so we can get rid of the bad stuff. But sometimes throughout the course of our lives, how many of you have ever been on an antibiotic? For maybe strep throat. Maybe um, you've been on one for an ear infection. Maybe you had an infection from a cut or a dog bite or something like that, and you've been on an antibiotic, maybe even for acne. Um, that antibiotic is there to kill bacteria. Does that antibiotic know the good from the bad? No. It's just there to kill bacteria. So when you do that, you eliminate the good bacteria that your body needs to help with things like digestion. And so therefore, there are foods, put your chair down, which are natural foods or just foods there that have that good bacteria back in there. So when you eat it, you replenish your body back with the good stuff that you need, like yogurt. Let's take a look and see what other types of foods have the good bacteria. If pictures of bacteria multiplying and dividing don't whet your appetite, keep watching. In fact, many of our favorite foods boast bacteria as an essential ingredient. Sourdough bread wouldn't be sour without Lactobacillus San Francisco. Just how this bread and bacteria got together remains a mystery. But legend has it that gold miners hungry for a strike left their real dough unattended and it soured on them. People learn to treat sourdough starter with proper respect. At Boudin's Bakery in San Francisco, bakers have been using the same mother dough or starter since 1849. But the secret sour making ingredient wasn't discovered until 1970 when the USDA finally identified the unique strain of bacilli bacteria. Veteran bakers, like Willie Joseph, practically worship the stuff. The fog, the bacteria, the steam out of the oven comes and, and, and all that flavor, all that smell, you know, people get all, mmm, so good. A little milk with your bread? Thank bacteria for that too. Trillions of bacteria break down food in the first of a cow's four stomachs, starting the milk making process. And when the milk is turning into cheese, bacteria go back to work adding flavor and form. Swiss cheese happens when a bacteria called propion breaks down and forms gas. The gas accumulates and makes little pockets or holes, known in the trade as eyes. You may never see bacteria the same way again. How many of you knew that you eat bacteria? Good. Yes, I'm talking about uh, stuff that you should eat not the stuff that you shouldn't. All right, so how else is bacteria helpful for humans? But we know that it's helpful because it's in our food to help us. It's also helpful in medicines like antibiotics. Penicillin's one of them. It's also helpful for humans because of our natural bacteria, which are called probiotics. Pro means for, good. Yeah, for good, means it's for you. So these are bio is, what's bio? Life, if you add an IC on it, that means little life, so it means good little life. These are good little li living things for you. It's in our body, it helps for digestion, and it helps protect us against infection. They're going to be the, the if you put it into terms of like a cartoon, they're like the family members of the bad bacteria. You know, some of us have, People in our family that when they come by, your family's like, oh gosh, someone's aunt so and so's coming over. Hope she doesn't stay long. Or mother in law's coming over. Hope she doesn't stay long. 
You know, my in-laws are coming for the holidays. Oh, that's what the good bacteria do. Like, oh, my bad cousins are coming by. You got to try to get them out of here as quickly as possible. So, good bacteria and bad bacteria. All right. There's some harmful bacteria. Harmful bacteria would be pathogenic bacteria. It's going to cause diseases and infections. You're going to watch a short video while you're listening. You do not need to write anything right now. Just listen to the short video because this is common amongst um, your age group and your peers on how bacteria affects you as a human. Hello, my name is Dr. Loretta Seraldo, board certified dermatologist and author of Six Weeks to Sensational Skin. This is about what bacteria causes acne. And it's actually very fascinating to me as a board certified dermatologist that when we look at people who have acne and we actually culture them, we find that oftentimes they have the same amount of the bacteria called P. acnes as people who don't have acne. So acne is not necessarily a totally bacterial disease. Acne really has a lot more to do with your pores getting clogged and then your skin reacting to the debris within the pores. But if you do have acne and you have a lot of pustules, meaning that you see little white pockets of pus, then ask your doctor to run a culture on your skin because you may be growing out another form of bacteria on your skin and you may have what's truly classified as a folliculitis. You may be, need to be put on different antibiotics to clear your skin. Good luck. This is Dr. Loretta Seraldo. So although you already have chemical imbalances within your body because you are a teenager and your chemicals are reacting so it's causing your body to excrete some toxins, which is acne, sometimes acne could be due to bacteria. That could be from the lack of washing your face properly, meaning when you get up in the morning, you just throw some water on your face or you just get a wet face rag and you wipe your face, but you're not properly cleaning and killing the bacteria. Bacteria is everywhere. So when you sleep, where do you think that bacteria is going? It's going on your face and all over your skin. Your face has pores. And more so, being a teenager, your pores are already acne prone. So if you don't properly clean them, then your pores will be more acne prone because now you have bacteria fighting with the other stuff that's going on with your face. And therefore, you would need some type of uh, attention to be to that bacteria so you can get rid of it so you can keep clear skin and not have overactive um, pimples and things like that. Some other things that, um, so you can put that one thing down as causes of um, harmful bacteria, so it can cause, it can cause what? Acne, and not just in you, you're more prone to, prone to it because you're teenagers and your skin is already going through something. But for anyone, it can cause um, acne. Another thing that it can cause, Pneumonia. So if you've ever heard anyone that has a pneumonia, that's a growth of bacteria in their lungs. Strep throat. Streptococci. That's what it looks like on the back of your throat. These white pockets of bacteria. It can also cause diarrhea. What's diarrhea? A feedback trying to do what? Get rid of not the extra water. It's getting rid of stuff that doesn't belong there. Your body's like, uh-oh, something's in here. Doesn't belong here. We got to boost this thing up fast and furiously. Tuberculosis. How many of you ever had a tuberculosis test? You all have. When you went before you started school, they prick your skin and they mark it with the marker. You got to come back three days to get it checked. I think we do that for school. 
No, they don't. They do that. No, I'm sorry. They do that for jobs because they want to make sure you're not contagious um, with this. So what happens with the test? They like kind of prick you. It's like a flu shot, kind of. Now you get the flu shot, but then that's to stop you from getting the flu. They kind of put the um, something in you that will only react if you have the, the bacteria inside you, and they prick you with like this um, bacteria. They prick you with it. And they circle it so they can see where they pricked you. Now, if you start getting inflamed and developing like a little rash there, then you have it. If you don't, then you don't. So three days later, you come back and to see how your body reacted um, to that. So it's kind of like trying to pull out the bacteria and see if it's there. It also can cause cholera. C-H-O-L-E-R-A. Cholera is a infection, which it shows you here, or a bacterial infection. It's pretty deadly. It's in areas where the water is not sanitized. So the water, it comes from uh, water that is infested with feces. Yes. Or in other third world countries. That's not feces. Yeah, but, but, most, but see the thing is, the water you can't tell that it has feces in it because it's small bacteria that you don't see but areas that does not have good sanitation, that does not clean the water, that water will be infested with this type of bacteria and it causes cholera and that is, it's very deadly. Syphilis, caused by bacteria. Syphilis can cause heart trouble, blindness, deafness, and mental disorders, lupus. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, but the fact of the matter, say someone has it on one of their sexual organs, it can transfer to any other part of the body. Arms, face, hands, legs, mouth, everywhere. Feet. It's a bacterial infection. It can be treated. All right. The prokaryotic cell cycle. Remember, it's not that complex, so its cycle is not that complex. It doesn't have the six stages of the cell cycle. It's very short. Uh, hepatitis is not a bacterial, it's a virus. So, no. Virus and bacteria are different, and we'll talk about that a little later. All right. Um, prokaryotic cells still go through a cell division. Who remembers from what Tim and Moby said, what does that cell division cause? Started with a B. Two words, one word started with a B, the other one started with an F. Putting in two is bi. There you go, binary fission. Good job. What does binary fission mean? What's binary? Two. Fission. Breaking, splitting or breaking in two, that's what it means. It's not going to pop on the screen. You need to put that on your paper, splitting in two. <coughs> oh, actually, it is going to pop on the screen. It's going to put it there. It's asexual reproduction. What does that mean? By itself. It produces by itself. To add that information as well. Binary fission is going to result in two cells that each contain one copy of DNA. This is the circular DNA here. What does what mean? Asexual. A means without sexual, so alone. That was binary fission. Because what happens is, what, what, what Tim and Moby showed you, um, that's happening within inside the cell where it says, and then it splits apart. Some of them don't go through binary fission. Some of them are like a sexual reproduction, but not really. All right, so at the bottom of your paper, you're going to draw the cell cycle of a prokaryotic cell. You don't need to label anything there. It starts off as one cell. You want to, like, I want you to draw it. Yeah, but you can put a circle around it, like, just don't forget, I'm not going to 
No, just draw a rod shape, just an oval, right? And then the squiggly lines in the middle, that's the DNA. You don't need to label it. And make sure you draw it as close, this as close to the top as bottom as possible because you're going to be drawing all of the steps underneath. From there, this is what you will label duplication of chromosomes. So notice it's a little bit longer and the DNA is a little bit more because it's duplicating the chromosomes. These two look like duplicated. So try to make them as similar as possible, but still kind of connected. And if you're drawing this, I want to make sure you're drawing this right in the middle at the bottom where you got this one at top, right underneath it, this one. And then there's going to be um, two more. So make sure you're not drawing it too big so you have space to be able to see the steps in process. So for step one, you're going to duplicate the chromosomes. After that, continued growth of the cell and this is what you noticed in that video this kind of looks like the telophase of a eukaryotic cell Mm -hmm, just like this. And then the last step, division into two steps. Very simple, very quick. And it's a fast process because it's so simple, bacteria can reproduce itself very quickly. And remember, they reproduce themselves to make new organisms. We reproduce ourselves to grow, repair, and replace. Yeah, because it becomes um, immune to whatever type of things we're killing it. Like, oh, I know about that already, so now the new ones that produce are immune to that because it's already within them. Is that one of the constant that bacteria is killing the bacteria? No growth of bacteria, yes. Yes. Can I move from here? Okay. How are you going to study your notes? You need to get a blank copy. We're going to review some information now. Can I go from here? Yes? We talked about two types of major cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. that it just reproduces itself very, very quickly. So it's everywhere. It's going to grow everywhere. And this is why it's important for you to be clean, for you to have cleanliness because of the simple fact that bacteria grows so fast. All right. Reviewing the differences and the similarities between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell. Just going over this list to make sure we remember the things from our eukaryotic cell. For a cell membrane, uh, animal and plant cells both have them. We're not going to go through this, through this entire list. Just look at it just to refresh your memory on what it is that animal and plant cells have alike. Animal and plant cells are what type of cell? Eukaryotic. When we look at the prokaryotic cells versus the eukaryotic cells, we notice that our prokaryotic cells are simple and easy to grow. Our eukaryotics can specialize. What does that mean? 
What does that mean that our eukaryotic cells can specialize? Get up and move back to your seat now. Move back there because you were more behaved here. What does that mean? Change into? Our cells can change into what? From, from when we're babies, they have to do this. They don't do it afterwards. Uh, Are all of our cells brain cells? No. So what happens? They have a specific function, meaning they're specialized to do a specific job. You have cells that work for the brain. You have cells that work for the heart. You have cells that work in the muscle area. Prokaryotics are fast reproduction. You saw in the video just in a moment ago how fast they were. Eukaryotic cells are multicellularity, meaning that they're reproducing for the benefit of the organism, meaning to grow, repair, and replace the organism. Prokaryotics are reproducing just to create a new organism. Hey. Prokaryotic cells are all the same, and eukaryotic cells are used to build large bodies. Somewhere on your paper, whether it be in any of the empty spaces or on a separate sheet of paper, you may have some space at the very bottom. I'm just going to draw three small um, circles for a triple Venn diagram. Yeah, you can draw it on your notepaper. paper. You got a little space at the bottom. You're not putting a whole lot of information. You left space there, Jordan. Doesn't have to be very big, but you need to be able to remember at the in the beginning I told you you're going to compare and contrast. What are some things that all of these cells have in common? They all have DNA. Where is that going to go? In the very, very middle where it's sharing all of them. They all have DNA. What else do they all have? They all do not have a cell wall. Which ones have a cell wall? Plant, prokaryotic. plant and prokaryotic. So that will go in the bubble where you have prokaryotic and plant. What else do they have? All have in common. Cell membrane. What other structures do they have in common? Structures. Structures. Cytoplasm. Ribosomes. There you go. Cytoplasm, cell membrane, ribosomes, DNA. All in common. Remember with the prokaryotic cell and the plant cell in the circles that overlap the two? Cell wall. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I don't see anything funny when you're being challenged. Are you going to study your notes? 